Hey everyone, um, I'm doing a recording a little bit different from uh, playing with some technology. <laughs> and I'm not that great at it, so it doesn't come out so great. You'll know why. Um, in the last uh, beginner's video, uh, we were talking about the tools that you need um, to be uh, a sewer um, with all the tools necessary to do a project. So one of those things that I mentioned was when you get a sewing machine and you get it from a private owner, you want to make sure that you have a bobbin that comes with it. And if you don't um, get a bobbin that comes with it, you want to ask the prior owner before you leave, do you know what size bobbin this machine takes? There are several different types have been over the years. Um, the most popular one used nowadays is a class 15. It comes in a plastic and a metal. Um, you probably recognize the metal one. It has all the little little, little holes on it. That's the class 15 metal one. Um, the class 15 plastic has two, no, one or two holes, but the thing is it is flat on both sides just like the metal one. So when you run your fingers on it you can tell it's just it's flat. There is the class 66 which was used predominantly with the older model sewing machines. And the reason why the bobbin is so important is I will tell you in a second. There are plastic class 66's that they made or I'm, I'm guessing and believing it was for the sewing machines were in the late 60's whereas the ones in the early 60's only would use the metal. And when I say they only would use the metal, well, you can tell the metal one when you touch it, it's it's kind of rounded both sides, same as the plastic one. When you put a class 66 bobbin in a new bobbin case, it's not, it may work. I haven't had one that worked all that well, if at all. I had a machine that I wasn't sure whether it took either one because it would still sew. And sometimes they were great stitches and some not so, but eventually I did research on how old the machine was. There is a database on the internet that Singer puts out. It's um you just search for serial sewing machine serial number database and it's ISMACS. It comes it comes up right away. And you can look up model numbers and find out pretty accurately when your machine was actually made or, or built. Um, then I have this <laughs> I have this own machine that a young man had purchased and the lady that I got it from I did not remember to ask about a bobbin. I should have. So I'm going through all of my bobbins and putting them on this bobbin winder on top of the machine and every single time the bobbin starts to turn it just flew right off it come right off it right off the, the bobbin uh, winder uh, post and I felt embarrassed and then he this young gentleman is, is one of the brand new spanking beginner type sewing people um, He's learning how to work a sewing machine, and it's kind of uh, intimidating for him. I can only imagine. Uh, you know, I've never had young men want to learn how to sew. Girls, yeah, all day long. But uh, so it's um, it's really refreshing to see. And he's there's one other young man in the same age bracket. I'd say like early 20s, maybe. Um, who was asking me all kinds of questions. How do I become a sewing class student? Da, da, da. And I go, well, I have YouTube. I can do it virtual, kind of like this with my laptop. I could actually do it through Zoom if someone wanted to do it that way. Um, you know, yeah, we're dealing with COVID-19, but it doesn't stop us creative people at all. Not at all. Okay, we find creative ways of getting around it. <laughs> so I went through all these different bobbins that I had, metal, plastic, and all that. For that one machine and before he left I had another vintage sewing machine that is really what he needed 
he didn't, he was just so excited to have the sewing machine. He didn't know what he wanted. He just said, I want a sewing machine and I'm ready to buy it now. <laughs> and it was so sweet. And when he came back today, this was his first class was today. Purchased the machine yesterday. Came back today for a class. And, and this is the thing you have to consider. When you buy your machine, you want to think about not just this week. If you plan on sticking with it, really getting to know your machine and really getting to know the craft of sewing to maybe possibly make clothes that fit you better than you've ever had before. You can do it. It's not difficult. Um, I've had to do it because I gain weight and lose weight and now I'm at the lost weight part and I'm going to try to stick with it and maintain it. <laughs> That's the hard part for me. But you want to know in your heart where you're going to go with the art that you are learning or already know. I've been doing this for 40 plus years and some days I still don't know what I'm going to do with it. But I keep being given challenges of different things to try and see just how far I can go with it. You never will. I started out with bonnets and now I do day spa steam down. Damn. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. You know, the, the the amount of so many different things you can do with the sewing machine. There are so many different things you can do with a serger. I didn't know you could do that much with a serger until a few years ago. And I thought, can you do blind hems with those things? Yeah, you can almost use a serger without ever having to have a sewing machine. I didn't know that. All you have to do is disengage the blade. So it doesn't cut the edge of the fabric. You just disengage the blade. Then, then, then it's a sewing machine. A big, heavy, fancy sewing machine, but it's a sewing machine. So this one that we couldn't figure out, I tried all these different bobbins. I came back in here, and one of the things, when you start really getting into it, you're going to find, like you saw with my toolbox, how many little things you have to handle all the time. All the time. And those little things fall on the floor. They fall, they can fall into your sewing machine. They can f fall in, you know, on your foot. Oh, especially pins. Oh my gosh. Until I found the industrial magnet bowl that I showed you on the last video, I was always stepping on pins and I was always going, mm. you know, taking a man of myself. I came back here and I have four drawers of different types of bobbins and one I had marked as vintage Kenmore because I have two vintage Kenmore desk sewing machines and that drawer there was this little guy well there's actually two of them this is actually a singer bobbin desk singer out there also so it may have came, come from there if you want to really and this is going to sound silly a way to save on these kinds of things when you have vintage sewing machines and you have to have a specific kind of bobbin for it to make it work for you and make it do what you want it to do you go on eBay you can go on local uh, Facebook yard sale uh, groups and do a search for vintage sewing machine accessories and you would be amazed how many people will have let me see if I have one back here yes I do they'll have something like this an old box but these old boxes have lovely treasures in them <laughs> um, there are certain presser feet that I don't have to fit this machine but I have to fit this one but I really want to use this one because this one has the features I like. That, that's kind of like how it goes. So I get these and I have tin ones. The tin ones are really amazing when they're in excellent condition. And you can tell who took care of their sewing machine and their accessories. And so you open it up and you have things like, things like this. This is a, it's tangled right now. There's a little jostling around there but a piece of metal like this and you're like what is that what do I do with it and then you have things like this and like I don't know what that is what is that and you kind of have to play around with it 
sometimes you figure out what it is. Other times, what you do is you take a photo of it and you go to a Facebook group called Sewing Machine Resource Center. They are very knowledgeable people. They helped me figure out. I had a pressure foot. I said, it looks like a buttonhole foot, but it doesn't look like a buttonhole foot. It was missing, to me, it was missing a part. But the old buttonhole foots aren't made like they are now. And then you'll have these kind of things will be floating around in here. Um, that's actually, I know that that's a Singer needle plate just because it has the big rounded up top, the old Singer ones. The newer ones are more narrow. And this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a zigzag. The reason why it's a zigzag is your straight stitch uh, needle plates will always have just a single hole. Now, unless, this is just my suggestion for you new guys that are just learning to sew. If you do not want to run the, run the risk of breaking a lot of needles, it gets expensive when you have to replace needles. And I think five needles is anywhere from six to ten dollars, depending on the brand name. Um, I try to find mine in bulk online. Um, there's different entities. Sometimes you can go to sewing machine uh, parts online uh, websites and find exactly what you're looking for, and it's going to be four dollars cheaper than Amazon even. So shop around. Sewing machine. There's another thing for you newbies. Sewing machine parts are not cheap. That's why I always suggest get a good vintage sewing machine because it's going to be mostly, if not all, metal. I have one that's all brass inside. It's gorgeous. But you do not want to be throwing money to things that you keep breaking. You just don't. Um, then you get frustrated with sewing, then you don't want to sew anymore, then you take your th sewing machine, you're just like, I'm just going to throw it away. Don't do it. <laughs> it's a very useful machine. But, so it turns out, when I looked this up, there really wasn't a, a photograph of it online, but it actually is a Singer 66, Class 66. It's not a Kenmore, it's not a generic, and it's not a household, it's, it's just a Singer 66. They made theirs a little bit different for certain year models of the sewing machine it has a notch in it so when I was trying to find out what kind it was what kind of bobbin it was I did single hole metal notched bobbin that's how I typed in my Google search and you can find online there's a uh, I'm gonna put it on um, my Facebook page so y'all can see it there's actually a printout a page that has all the different bobbins that have been made I don't know if it's all of them, but it's a bunch of them, and they're all the same, but different. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how you go from generation to generation. But that's a little bit of history. I kind of threw that in there, sorry. But what this is, we know we have our tools, we have our sewing machine, and now we have to figure out how to use the sewing machine. That's the main thing. Make sure you get a copy of the manual, even if it's just a PDF download free down you can there's thousands and thousands of free downloads of manuals and um, the uh, service manual there's a user manual and there's a uh, service manual the service manual for you guys who are new at this if you can locate one for your sewing machine please get it the reason why I say that is the service manual lists the parts of your sewing machine and the service manuals that I have seen are wonderful for troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is like a big thing when you're new at it and you really don't have someone close by that you can say, hey my needle's jammed, what do I do? If you have a service manual, it points out the things that will cause that and it shows you how to fix that without having to, sometimes you don't even ever have to open it up. It's just a matter of a wiggle here, a wiggle there, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I wish that when I got my first sewing machine, I'd had a service manual. They didn't provide one back then. Well, if they did, when you bought it at the retail level, it wasn't included. Oh, I'll give you a desk all day long. Sewing so machine and a desk. Yeah, here you go. Big long thing. Service manual? No. 
user's manual? Oh, yeah, instructions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how to fix it? No. I think it was a ploy. But anyway, so look, keep an eye out for these little things because you can find treasure troves in these. Um, when you get your, when you've got your sewing machine, there's another thing. If you're going to delve into anything other than straight and zigzag stitches, whenever you first start out, create for yourself projects that are only straight stitch or zigzag stitch, uh, not decorative edge stitches. You know where it, it looks like little bridges and stuff like that. No, 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 none of that embroidery type looking stitch. You want to do straight and zigzag, straight for your main seams, your 5 8 inch, excuse me, it is 5 8 is, is the standard seam width on clothing, except for men's dress formal suits. They get extra fabric in their clothes, ladies. I like about four inches on each side. I have done alterations on men's suits, and the first time I did one, I got mad. I said, I'm a woman, and I only get five eighths inch, and this guy gets four inches? What's up that? So I digress, sorry. All right, um, you want a machine that's going to, for the where you are right now, and what you want to do right now, of course I've graduated to all this crazy stuff here I mean, you see I've got machines everywhere <laughs> um, and you don't want it to be overwhelming you want something that will do a little something special but not be something that you just like oh, there's too many dials or too much of this so that's why I went for a Kenmore the first time my first sewing machine was Kenmore um, this is a beautiful Kenmore right here this is a vintage Kenmore it was actually a prototype. Now, I don't have the benefit of a manual because it's a prototype. There wasn't one created for it, or if it was, it didn't make it with the machine. It didn't get, it didn't get to go out the door with it. Um, it has some very unique features, um, not just the way it's shaped. It almost looks industrial, um, but that's what I like. It has a nice wide um, workspace of a table tabletop so that's something you want to look at if you're going to be doing a lot of let's say you want to do quilts you want you want some table space you might want to get they also have for even for these machines sometimes you can find a quilting bed that adds more length and width to it for when you're doing your motifs when you're quilting in the manual, in the very beginning of the manual, it shows the parts of your sewing machine. Get familiar with them. That's why I can't stress enough being someone new at sewing. Read your manual. You don't have to read it first. Just look at the pictures. <laughs> look at the pictures. Look at your machine and connect the two. Then when you go to put your hands on it and you're going, oh, I remember that. That's the top tension. Oh, I remember that. That's the stitch width. Because sometimes they'll be labeled on your machine. It'll say stitch width. It'll actually show the words. The old machines from the 60s do. They are labeled for you. Now, this is a 70s. It's still vintage, but it's a 70s. And uh, they're not labeled. It's, pi it's pictures. It's not words. So for if you're a young person and really want to get a good foothold, you know, a good foundation, get a 60s machine with a straight and zigzag stitch, the ideal one, and this is the one that um, my young student ended up with. When he told me he was making skinny leg jeans, I said, you picked a tabletop sewing machine and you need a free arm. Free arm, why? His pant legs are skinny. He's not going to be able to top stitch them at all without being, having the free arm to slide it onto. So this one is interesting in the fact that this has a huge storage uh, for presser feet and stuff. If you're limited in space and you don't have room to put, you know, all this organizational stuff up here, the, the, the craft cabinets, and I labeled all the little drawers, you don't have room for that. 
look for a machine that has a big accessories box that is detachable to be able to use for now. That's one of the reasons why I love this machine. I can put everything I need in it. Say I had to take this to my son's house and fix his wife's evening dress or something. I can put all the press and all the other stuff in here, grab the handle and go. And that's the, the different things you want to look at being someone new learning how to sew. It's, I know it may sound silly, but if you think about it, I wish I had a dime for every time when I was younger. I went to sit down, had a project all laid out, had the fabric, had the pattern, pinned it, this and that, and I go to sew and I go, where's the zipper foot? I'm putting in a zipper, I don't have a zipper foot. I have to get in the car, go buy a zipper foot and come back. And the attachments at retail are ridiculous. That's why I look at people who, there are a lot of people who take sewing machines and they break them down for parts and they sell every little part of it. I mean, you'd be amazed. There's so many pieces used to make these. So, a free arm on this one, it just kind of lifts out. You can see now I have a free arm. If you're going to do pant legs or sleeves, and some people like to put, you know, decorative stitching a little bit higher up on the sleeve. Look at the length of the free arm portion of it. You don't want a short one unless you're only going to do like hemming pants and doing cuffs at the very bottom. But if you're going to have, like he, like I said, he's doing skinny leg jeans, he needed a long free arm to be able to slide that on there because he wants to top stitch the outside seam with a contrast color thread. And the only way he's going to be able to do that is with a long free arm. And I just happened to have one that was the same price. I just swapped them out for him. He went, I couldn't believe it. I said, you need to have the tools for the job. That's the whole point. You know, and if you have a passion for the thing I have a passion for, why not? So, typically they either slide in, slide in, snap in, or whatever. On your, your bobbin cases are either going to be ones that are underneath in the front. So when you're looking at your manual, you get really do get familiar with your machine. Make it your best friend. You know, know it inside and out as far as what is what and where it is. This one's really nice because it has a little glass window in it. So you can actually, if you think about keeping a presence of mind to keep an eye on how much threads in that bobbin, nobody, including me, likes to get all the way done with a hem on a wedding gown. You've got maybe two feet left. And you run out of bobbin thread. Yeah, that's not fun. Because now you have to unthread the machine, get the bobbin out, put the bobbin up here, put more thread on it, put it back down in, and then and, and finish it. And then of course now you got to you know do the little two two stitches up, two stitches back, and then snip it off so they can't see that you had to stop almost at the end. That's why the other thing. If you, do, if you have a machine that only has one thread spool, this little guy on top, if you only have one, there is a, I call it a secondary spool stand that you can get. You can even make one. Look on YouTube for these, this little gal. She makes a second a thread spool out of a CD disc holder base and a plastic hanger. <laughs> and she puts a cone of thread on it as her extra spool of thread. So I know it's a lot to absorb and I know I'm giving you a lot of information and it's okay if you don't get it at first, but as you sew yourself, you will come up with your own ideas, your own shortcuts, the things that work for you. What work for me might not work for you. So these will either pop out, like this one pops out. This is the bobbin cover plate. So you're gonna pop out, slide back, but not slide all the way off. Some of them do slide all the way. Some of the really old sewing machines they do. Or it'll lift up. I have several vintage sewing machines from the 60s. It lifts up, but it doesn't come off at all. So you literally gotta 
kind of slide your hand in there to put the bobbin in and out. And the feed dog plate, needle plate uh, actually, you have ones that have, like this one has two screws that screw in. You'll have one that'll have a hole on one side and it just sort of sits on that hole. And then there's another one that looks like a big, almost like a silver penny kind of thing. And it's kind of spring loaded. And it's the locker. It, it locks it in place. So you lift that up to get the, the thing off. Um, and then there's a, one that I call it a three point plate, needle plate. And it has three screws um, two on the side and one at the top. It's just kind of there to keep it snug. Um, those are the ones that I have so far that I've used. So, you know the parts of the machine. The next thing you're going to want to do, and in your manual it'll show you how to thread the machine. It'll show you first the parts of your sewing machine, then how to thread the machine, then it goes to the bobbin part, how to wind the bobbin, how to put the bobbin in. Um, they manufactured the manuals very well, especially for you guys that are new and just learning the process and what you're doing. So do not be overwhelmed. Take it slow. Just like I told this young man, I said, I said, breathe, take it slow. You'll be fine. He was having trouble figuring out how to wind the bobbin. He got the machine home. I'd shown him like three or four times. But when you do it the first time yourself, you don't have the confidence level. And I get it. I was there. I've done it before. So I told him, I said, even though this one has a taller spindle, it's exactly like what you have. And you click it the same way. You wind the thread around. You do, you do it all the same way. Just take the time. I know you're excited. You want to get your first project done like he does. And, oh, he puts more stress on himself. He wants it done by Halloween. That's just a couple days from now. But anyway, <laughs> which I thought was kind of, you know, putting yourself in some stressful moment to thread any sewing machine. You have the ones that were built in the 50s and before, the ones that have the real old timey shape and have the fancy the cow. Uh, flowery things all over it and things, rotary machine and all that kind of thing. Those are unique in the sense they do not thread on the front. They thread on the back. If you want to sew just straight stitch and and you just want something that looks really cool, get one of them. Oh yeah, get you a Clone 15 Morse sewing machine. A Bel Air sewing machine. Looks like a singer with the black and the gold, but it's absolutely fabulous. I have one of those. Um, they're works of art. That's why you see so many people who like vintage sewing, those vintage sewing machines. I call some sewing machines left-handed or right-handed. I'm left-handed. And the reason why I say it about the sewing machine is wherever your tension is. And you notice that when I said this is a prototype, you don't see the little tension dial on the front of this machine. You don't see it on here on this. This, this is another Kenmore, more modern one. But the tension dial is recessed in the front. This one, it doesn't have it there. That's why it was a prototype. They were trying to get, I guess, get away from having something that could like go wrong easily. And the really old ones, because they have the little wire that you have to have the. Right? And I'll, I'll show you one of this in the next video on how that's done. But most of them, for, for the most part, the upper tension is going to be on the front. Upper tension does what? It gives resistance to the thread on top. You have to have the right amount of upper tension with your bobbin tension to make a stitch. If you don't, and you don't have your needle to your bobbin timing just right, you will not get stitches. Or if you do get them, they're going to look awful. 
so to thread any sewing machine and I've seen, I've seen on Facebook on these sewing machine uh, groups women who say I just got this machine I don't have a manual and I don't know how to thread it I go huh I don't know how to thread a sewing machine. They haven't really changed much in over a hundred years, but I guess some people are just tied to the fact if I don't have a manual, I can't do it. Some people just aren't adventurous enough. I guess I'm too adventurous, but anyway. So, any of, I'm going to unthread this. I'm going to do that. Um, also, if you do get a newer machine, and it has what's called an automatic needle threader. It's not automatic in that sense. And if you go into the store and you say, oh, I don't, because you don't want to thread the needle, because it's a tiny little hole. You don't want to have an automatic needle threader. Is the only part that's automatic is how you pull it down. It's spring loaded. It twists when you pull it down. It puts the little hook through the needle eye, it's supposed to anyway. I have one that's not working right now. I'm trying to figure out how to adjust it. And then it will pull the thread through it to the back for you. That's as automatic as it gets. But when you get your machine and you're ready to get started, you're ready to get started, you put your thread on top. And you guys, being new, you probably would not think to look. I've broken enough thread. To remember to look now. A spool of thread, when you purchase it, it's all nice and tight. There's no ends. You won't see an end on it. To find the end, you have to peel up this little label on the top just a little bit. And sometimes you can just run your fingers around the edge like this. Like I'm doing. You can do it here. And then you'll get, oh, snag. Something pokes you. Well, if you or that snags you, you lift the label up, and there's the end of the thread under the glue under that little label, a little sticker on top. Some people hate horizontal thread pins. This being a thread pin, they can't stand the horizontal one for one reason. When you have a horizontal thread pin. There's a guard. This is one right here. There's a guard that goes on the end. It goes on the end to keep that spool of thread as it, it's the thread's being pulled to make stitches from going flying right off. That's what that's for. And that's why most people don't like this because they end up losing these. It's one of those things they lose. And they get mad because now they can't use the machine. You can buy these and they're not expensive, but you know, you can make one up. <laughs> you can get, you can take a piece of felt and a little circle of cardboard and just put a little hole in the center of it and stick it on there. It'll hold your thread on there for you. You, you, you can finagle it. I mean, you can, uh, you know, make do. We used to have to when we were younger. Most individuals want a vertical thre thread pin. And I don't blame them. I prefer them. But if I don't have one, I can deal with the other one. I don't make a big stink about it. So, um, with that, and like I said, this one being prototype, if your machine only has one thread spool or pin, excuse me, if it only has one, and you're not watching your bobbin thread or listening to, it's like, oh, it sounds like it's running out. When that runs out and you do not have a second spool of thread, the same color you're using or whatever's in the bobbin casing, guess what you have to do? Well, you can't finish your project because you don't have enough, you don't have any thread on your bobbin anymore, but you need it to do the stitches. So you have to unthread your machine completely to be able to use the thread on that one spool pin to attach it to that bobbin to fill that bobbin up and finish what you're making and that's one of the things that I, drives me nuts so I always look for a machine that has two 
And if it doesn't have two, then I get one of those. I think they're, they even call a, spa a spare or an additional uh, spool something. Um, it, you know, thread spool. Additional thread spool. Um, and this one has... Uh, I can, this has the extra one. It's so cool because it's, it just flips in and out. So, if I ran out of my bobbin thread here, as long as I had the same color on this one, all I, I could leave my machine threaded, pull that thread up, put it around the little bobbin uh, thread wheel, fill the bobbin up, put it in, keep going. Whatever you can do when you're doing this for the first time, that is efficient for you and everyone has different ways of doing different things and I, I understand that uh, the way I do things may not be the same as anybody else probably aren't um, once you get I call it when you get your niche you figure out what your niche is as far as flow when it comes to sewing anything it literally is like an assembly line what you're doing is basically an assembly line kind of item you have step one you have a pattern Step two, you prepare the pattern. Step three, you put the pattern on the fabric. Four or five, and it's literally going down an assembly line. And you set up your machine. Or you can set up your machine first, and then do the pattern and all that stuff. And just what works best for you. And that's really the gist of it. Um, threading any sewing machine. You want to find out where the little notch is. And you want it to be, if it's a vertical pin, on the top. You always want the thread to unroll away from you so I don't know if you can see but here's the thread it's in the front so when I do this it's rolling away from me that's what you do with your thread even if this was horizontal same thing because you would notice that that little nick thing you don't want it on the outside because if you start sewing fast that little thing's going to catch your thread, it's going to break the thread, and then it'll be madder than a hornet. Because now you got to re-thread the machine again, and again, usually, and again, and again. Because you forget that that thing is there. I've had days where I thought I had it on the right, kept breaking thread. I said, what's wrong with this machine? It was me. <laughs> so, you're going to put it on there. As far as thread type, whatever brand thread you use on top has to be the exact same brand of thread in your bobbin the reason for that is the thread companies don't all weave their thread the same they may have the same colors but when it comes to the texture thickness weave strength they're not the same so if you're going to use Gunderheim uh, thread, because it's a good quality, it's a very good quality thread, but you have to use the same thread in the bob bottom, in the bobbin. Because if you took a Coates and Clark thread on top, put a Gunderman in the bottom, oh, oh, oh yeah, it's not going to come out so good. Not, not so good. So the thread goes away from you. What The next thing that you look for is thread guides on your machine. This one, I don't want to see it, do you? Not any there, but there's one on the back. Um, this, I'm going to tilt this up so you can at least see this one. Oh, Lord. Okay. Do you see? Oh, no, I don't know. This is a thread guide, but only for when you're winding a bobbin. You do not put your upper thread around that. It's only for when you're doing a bobbin. Because it, that can snag it, break it, cause your top tension to look like it's too tight and it's not. It's just in a place it's not supposed to be. Now this machine, it's on the back. That's the first thread guide. I love the old, old machines because they have these little curly cube metal pieces. And you just go, <laughs> you gotta like wiggle it through there. But, so they're easy to find you can see them right away so that's why I said even though it's an old machine 
thing for the best. And that's what some people don't understand. Sometimes older is better. Older homes were built better. Now you can they throw a house up in three weeks and they go, the wind's going to come by and blow it over. So that's your first thread guide. So you look for the first thread guide. And like I said, in the manual, it shows you the parts. And then it's going to show you how to thread the machine. Then you're going to see on the following pages. And they're, it's funny because they do it in order. Like it, it was, it's an order that it should be. So you find the first thread guide on the back side. And it comes up here. And as you can see, every single sewing machine has this slit in the front. It's like a gap. There you go. So this is a right-handed machine because it's going from the right to the left. If your tension's on the right, you're going to go from right to left. If your tension's on the left, you're going to go from left to right. And I don't know if I have a left to righty. I don't think so. No, I do have one, but I don't know which one it is. I do have one sewing machine that, that threads the opposite way. Because when I went to thread, I went, this is backwards. <laughs> but if you have your manual, you don't have to worry about that. It, it'll show you exactly what to do. So you come from your first thread guide through the slot in the front on the right side in this case. And you take it down. And on other machines, there'll be the discs, the tension discs will be here. And you want to make sure that that thread gets between those tension discs. If it doesn't, it's going to be a loosey-goosey and it's not going to be a stitch at all. Okay. Then you come down. Now this one has a special little metal thread guide here. So you come down this side and there's a thread guide here. So you go down to that thing, and you're going to come around the bottom for this one, and you come up. Now, the arm that this goes on, you can't really see it, but it's right, it's just barely peeking up here. Okay, so you're going to come around to the right of the left side, Does that makes sense. So when you put it through the left side and go over the thread arm. I can't get it up any higher. Sometimes you gotta kind of look down in there to make sure you're catching it because you go around the right and then back down the left side. So I went down, under the bottom, up, and around the piece inside. The really older machines, they didn't have a, it looks like a metal slot, slot the thread through it. It was a solid hole, like if it was an oversized needle. And that's, you had to literally feed it through it. I like that feature in the older machines for one main reason. More consistent tension between the top thread and the bottom thread. It didn't have any other choice. So then you come down, and then there's another guide thread guide here, right across from the first one on the other side. And you want to make sure that your thread goes behind that one. But can get it in there. You don't be mean to me there. You don't be mean to me there. There it goes. They wanted me to go from the right to the left. I should have known that. Now, when you come down to your needle, your needle also has a thread guide. So there's thread guides all over the place. You just have to look for them. If you miss one, you'll have bad stitches. So if you're stitching in your machine for the very first time, and you're all excited, and your stitches are just not what they're supposed to look like, I can't tell you how many times people thought it was tension. It's not tension. The first rule of thumb is, if you don't have stitches after you've threaded your machine and done your test stitching, anytime you start a new project, make sure you have a scrap of the fabric that you're going to be sewing on because you don't want to be sewing on the, the product that you want for your final thing to wear and it be all messed, the stitches all be messed up, you got to rip them out. Or you don't. 
do it on a scrap piece of fabric. That is why I stress the test stitch test first. First thing, if your stitches aren't coming out, re-thread your machine. I've sat here and argued with myself. I know I threaded it right. I know I did. I didn't do it wrong. And I missed one thread loop, one thread guide. And when I, So I would thread it again, thinking I'd already done it right the first time. And then it was stitched, and I go, I guess I didn't. See, I don't have me to argue with, so it's okay. I mean, it's better that way anyway. Who wants to argue with someone else? But another thing, if your thread is kind of fuzzy at the end, it's not like a clean cut. And I do this all the time. I have to snip it. But I... Oh, that's why I said it above my head. Okay. So it's a little fuzzy. So I just make it a nice clean cut. Go through all the thread guides, right to left, down up, down up, and then you put it. If you don't have an automatic thread threader, you do it by hand. And we're gonna stop here in a minute because I've kind of outwinded you guys, and we'll pick up from here next time. So you want to make sure that you get. In there. Now, look, my hands tend to be kind of warm, and because of that, I'm always yelling at the thread, let go of my fingers, because it likes to stick to me, like, like tacky people. And adjust my glasses, so you can see. Now, right now, this needle is on the left side, which tells me one of two things. I either used it to do zigzag stitch last, or I purposely positioned the needle to the left because of what I was stitching. Um, instead of using a zipper foot or trying to stitch real close to an edge, some of these machines you can actually uh, change the needle position to left, middle, or right. Well, this is not. Okay, a lot of people will take the end of this thread and they'll do like that. Wet your finger. Put it on there behind it. And I'm actually going to put this needle in the middle. Where it's supposed to. Now it's in the middle. The middle on this machine is always for straight stitch. Um, you do want to start out with a straight stitch when you're doing your test stitches first. Some people do the zigzag first. Um, I mean, that's just up to you how you want to do it. And if I don't get this in there by this way, I'm grabbing my uh, tweezers. Uh -huh. Yep, gotta grab the tweezers. Sometimes, I mean, as you get older, that's for me. Um, your hands aren't as steady or stable. It's not a bad thing, it's just a sign of life. And if you have tweezers in the hole of thread, you have more control, number one. The thread doesn't do all this wiggly around stuff. And it behaves better, typically. I just did something I didn't realize it anyway. But um so once you do this, I'm gonna show you the bobbin part really fast and we're gonna end it with drawing the bobbin uh, thread up. Then you go when you look in the manual about you know, how do you set your machine for a straight stitch, how do you set it for the zigzag stitches, and then you do test stitches. Now there is another option. <laughs> and I'm getting tired. Um, there is somewhere in here a needle threader. 
Let's see. Where are you, little guy? Here's the thing. one more color try because I want you to see how it's supposed to pull the bobbin thread up so I'm going to put it back down if it doesn't pull it up then the timing is most likely off or the needle is bent so when you're not getting stitches and you um because I can't see it. And you take the thread out and you re-thread it and you still don't get good stitches. The next thing you do, change the needle. Whatever you do, especially you new guys, whatever you do, do not touch that tension unless, until you absolutely have to. And absolutely have to means you've done all the other things. Re-threading it, test stitching and the uh, changing the needle. It only takes a fraction, a milli millisecond of a, I don't even know, you know, something that's not even visible to the eye it takes for a needle to not make proper stitches. It doesn't take much. The slightest little bend in that needle from hitting a uh, be it needle plate or anything you know, like in the bobbin case inside the machine um, to slightest bend and it will not stitch. I didn't realize they were that sensitive but they are. They're very, very sensitive. I think I got it this time. I hope. I'm going to show you one thing that's going on here. That's not cool. Yeah, I got it. Um. This one has an older foot on it, and this is a high shank foot. Well, actually, it's a super high shank. Um, this particular Kenmore, because it's part of it, it has a really long pressure foot. And this part of the pressure foot sticks up and hooks to the pressure bar. That's called a shank. If you ever see a sewing machine that has a black shank on it and we guaranteed it's a Kenmore because they were the ones the ones that had the super high shank and they had them with black I just gotta find some more of these I only have one that's what it came with so when you're putting on your presser feet on any machine there is a I want to show you there is a cutout right here the U shape there they tightening knob that holds this in place sits in that. The other reverse side of it sits around the presser bar. So these, I like these because they're a lot easier to install. Um, you don't have to kind of wiggle it on there, it just kind of slides up and you put the, so you slide it all the way up and you've got to hold it as far up as it'll go. If you have the least little give in it, it'll wiggle loose while you're sewing. And then you risk breaking the needle, breaking the foot somehow. You, know, you, just, you just don't want to take that risk because they're not cheap to replace. So you do that. Now I'm going to put the bobbin thread back in the bobbin bo so that you can see at the time, whether the time is or not. Okay. And, oh, gosh. Oh, I got it. Oh, I knew it was going to do that. Alrighty. This little guy. Top load bobbins. You just have to think of them as front loads sideways. The front load goes like this. You put it in. This is the same thing but flipped up. Flat. So when you put it in, if this had a bobbin casing 
that was external that you clipped in, it would go the same way. So all you're doing is, if you had the bobbin casing outside, I can show you. Uh, yeah, that's one of these. I have extra stuff all over the place for the purposes of demonstration. These are brand new ones. So if this was a front load sewing machine and I wanted to do the bobbin for it, the bobbin case has a little lever on the back. You can see that? That's mainly so you can grab onto it to put it back in. It's to give your fingers help. This little arm, as you put it into a front load, you'll hear it you just kind of wiggle a little bit and hear it click and it locks in place. Top loads are completely different in that respect. But this one, the way I remember how to, to do it, I have the little arm at the top and the end of the thread is going to be the same, kind of like the same shape. So the thread is the top too. So you put it in and on the end there's a little cut, cut out little notch and so that end of the thread goes in that, in there, and then it comes back and goes through this big hole. So now the thread is to, it came out out of here. So it's hard to see with this camera. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do this better than with my phone. My phone keeps telling me the storage is full and I think it's garbage because I've deleted so much stuff out of it already. But a top load one. Same thing. Instead of this being like this, like the shape of the metal casing, you go. You're going to lay it down inside that bobbin casing. So it's, the tail's coming this way, just like in the metal one. And then there is a spot in the machine. I don't know if you can. See really see but the thread is coming I'm unwinding this way and you're going to go backwards and go through this slot there's a slot right there I'm going to do it this way there's a slot right here and you bring the thread back through that and out of the to, to the back side and once you do that you want to leave it a little loose. You put the bobbin case plate back on. Your top thread is air needle threaded. You want it to keep loose. The one thing I did leave out, and I do apologize, when you are threading your machine, you always have the presser bar up. Why? Because it gives it slack. And it doesn't put extra stress on the tension plates for when you're sewing. To make sure your tension plates are working properly, before you pull up your bobbin bed, put the pressure of it down for a second. And then take it right here above the needle and pull on it from the top down. And this it is tight. So those pressure plates are doing the job. They're keeping it taut. Okay. So then, and lift that back up, because you want the top thread to be kind of loose, so that when the uh, blade comes around, it will grab the thread from the top. So, put that down, and you always turn your hand wheel on the side towards you, you never turn it away from you. A young man asked me why. Why do you only turn it towards you? I said because there's a motor, and if you turn it the opposite way, other than the motor runs, you can mess the motor up. Without a motor, you have no sewing machine. So when I see, and I can see through the little window that the bobbin started to move because the top thread grabbed the bobbin thread. It's just amazing how these are put together. I just, I don't get it. It works. And then you pull your top thread up, and what it does is it brings up the bobbin thread in the bottom. It's a loop, 
to find some glow in the dark or chaos and further bigger. And now the top and the bottom are both on top. The bottom thread. That's the end that's sticking on me. Okay. Sometimes I have to. That's why I try not to have the, uh, the tail of the bobbin thread uh, trapped under the, the metal bobbin door. You don't want to do that. So once you've done that, once you have mastered getting it threaded and getting the bobbin set up, we didn't wind the bobbin, but we will next time. Um, and then we'll play with some of the stitches so that you get familiar with the new machines now to set them up with a straight stitch or a zigzag stitch is totally different from what I learned when I went to school back in the 70s. So when you do your test stitches, the one great thing when you kind of don't know what you're doing, but you kind of do know some of what you're doing, is to try every single fancy stitch on that dial to say you can do it and also it helps you to know your machine better how to do those things and that's the most fun part about it and then you can think of hey, that would be great on the edge of a collar you know, really, you know things like that um that's the kenmore 1789280 and it's my go-to machine because it has never let me down my first kenmore never let me down and it's in my hands of my oldest son and he's getting to ready to enjoy it and i'm enjoying this one and i just want all of you that are new and i do apologize for the time frame i just get a little carried away and giving out information if you have any ideas of how i can cut that down for you if you don't if you, if you mind sitting through me so long I'm, i've tried to keep them down to like 30 or 40 minutes but today i went overboard sorry i felt like i had to fill in a lot of holes because i because i was away for so long um Please leave me comments. I do read them. I take them to heart. If there's something specific that you want me to teach or show you, please let me know. Like my YouTube channel. Share it. Subscribe. Keep me going because obviously I, if I had <laughs> if I had more people watching, I could break it, down, break, break it down to the smaller chunks for everybody. I don't know. I guess I'm going to have to do an outline, but you guys are all young. How about you put together an outline for me and I'll see if I can stick to it. Um, I have uh, been light scribing my sewing machine manuals. They turn out pretty good. It's another little, little uh, thing. Um, I thank you for your time. And I'm sorry I can be a little chatty Cathy, but that's the passion in me for this type of craft. I love it. I get up in the morning just for it. It's, it's as my husband. Um, if you find that this wakens up the passion in you, go for it full force. Make a name for yourself. Design something that nobody else has so that you can say, that is mine. My reversible bonnets, my glamour bonnet, those are mine. That was my design. I personalize them. I haven't seen anybody else doing it, so mine. <laughs> so, I love you guys. Please leave comments, share, like, subscribe, give me more ideas. Lord knows I got enough of my own. But they tend to get a little crazy as you see. So if you think I've missed something, I need to know that too. Because sometimes I will. Because I forgot about the bobbin thing. And uh, next time, we'll get more into the actual sewing. Um, foot pedal pressure is extremely important. Some machines have settings for where they're going to sew fast or slow. And that can, can scare you to death. Or get you all excited and we'll tackle that one in the next time so to all my beginners miss taylor and joe j and um 
Mr. Jordan now. Um, I appreciate y'all, and I can't wait to teach you some more. Please have a wonderful weekend, and always happy sewing.